I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us right now on ABC News Live. Continuing coverage of our breaking news. The major Supreme Court decision on gun rights in America. The court has struck down a New York gun restriction on conceal and carry permits. What it means for the future of the Second Amendment and our country and other gun laws. Now, the gun law that the court struck down in this case was over 100 years old and required people to show proper cause to get a license to carry a concealed weapon outside of the home. Now, analysts say it could have a sweeping impact on concealed carry measures nationwide and could allow more people to legally carry guns on the streets of some of our largest cities, including New York, Los Angeles, and Boston. New York Democratic Governor Kathy Hochul already reacted to the ruling almost immediately after it was issued. Here's what she had to say. We just received some very disturbing news from Washington that the Supreme Court of the United States of America has stripped away the state of New York's right and responsibility to protect its citizens with a decision which we are still digesting, which is frightful in its scope of how they are setting back this nation and our ability to protect our citizens back to the days of our founding fathers. The National Rifle Association has also reacted to the decision, tweeting, quote, NRA victory. The Supreme Court affirmed that the right to bear arms does not stop at a person's front door. I want to go to ABC News senior national correspondent Terry Moran for more on this. Terry, what was the legal argument behind this decision and what kind of an impact can it have on not just New York's gun law, but many around the country? It's a big ruling, Diane, no question about it. It will have a big impact. And the foundation of it in Justice Clarence Thomas's opinion for the court uh, is the text of the Second Amendment and the history of our country when it comes to guns. And that, Justice Thomas said, is where any law that seeks to limit Americans' ability to keep arms in the home or bear them on the streets of the country must begin. Uh, he said that the problem with the New York law, as you pointed out, is that it required citizens, law-abiding citizens, to show that they had a special need for a firearm. Justice Thomas says no other constitutional right uh, works like that, and New York's law must fall. But he went on to say that the Second Amendment's guarantee of the right to bear arms out the, outside the home uh, is, is, cannot be overcome in, uh, by judges or by legislators unless they can show that the regulation they want on limiting how people carry arms outside the home is consistent with regulations from colonial America, from early America, from 19th century America. You can't say, well, we now live in, in a crowded city with lots of crime. Uh, we don't want people wandering around the streets of our city with guns. He says that's not good enough, that, that simply you cannot dis declare an entire city immune from the Second Amendment. What this opinion does is reset the gun rights debate in favor of those people who say that Americans have a foundational constitutional right to bear arms anywhere they want unless the government can show otherwise in a way that is consistent with our history of gun ownership in this country. And I want to go to senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer uh, for a little bit more on that because uh, the original opinion, uh, Devin, was written by Justice Thomas, but Justice Kavanaugh joined that opinion and clarified that uh, concealed carry laws are still okay as long as they're not discretionary. So what do you think that word discretionary means in that context? What does that leave open? Well, New York and these seven other states, Diane, leave it up to local officials to decide whether you can get a permit or not. And so that's what they mean by discretionary. It's sort of, um, you know, an unbounded ability of an official to grant or deny someone a permit in those states. And so that's what he said is problematic. Um, but what the court made clear was that licensing requirements are still OK in a number of states that have them. Um, you know, requirements that you get, you know, a background check, that you be fingerprinted in some cases, that you go through training, that can all stand in this case. Um, what we should also add is that the court did not address requirements about places that you can carry the gun uh, in, in, you know, in any of these states. And remember, most states allow open or, you know, concealed carry without a permit. Um, so there's a lot still to be fleshed out about gun rights in this country in the court system. And what today's decision did is, yes, it addressed 
passed those permitting uh, regulations in that handful of very populated states, but it also set a new standard for how courts nationwide will start to, to wade through all of this gun legislation that we've been talking about in the wake of these mass shootings. Um, and, and Clarence Thomas today said in a very full-throated um, statement that history and tradition will be the guiding force, as Terry was talking about. And I want to bring in our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky, uh, covering this story from New York. Uh, Aaron, the governor, Kathy Hochul of New York, wasted no time offering her opinion on that, which, of course, we just saw. We're also hearing from the Manhattan DA and some other leaders. So what's the plan now in New York? The Manhattan District Attorney, the, the mayor of New York, Eric Adams, each issued statements to say that this decision, they believe, will put New Yorkers at risk. And what they've been doing over the last several weeks and months behind the scenes is preparing to figure out what laws they can put in place to go right up to the line the Supreme Court would allow. The mayor, in a statement issued a moment ago, said he cannot allow New York City to become the Wild West, as he put it. And so he is now going to work with the legislature to determine what sensitive locations might be available to him to make guns off limits. And he's talking about places like the subway or an arena like Madison Square Garden or a baseball stadium like Yankee Stadium. Would it be acceptable under this new decision to make guns off limits, even if you can have a, a concealed carry permit without this extra uh, notion of a, of a proper cause. And that's what they've been looking at behind the scenes and what they'll now try to legislate with the help of state lawmakers, Diane. Uh, Kate, what does this do, uh, Supreme Court contributor Kate Shaw, what does this do uh, for the prospect of more court cases coming before not only local courts, but the Supreme Court? You know, I think that those who oppose gun laws all of a sudden have an, an important new tool to challenge those laws, and that is this opinion and essentially the method it sets forth for how all gun laws are to be evaluated when they're challenged, um, and that is that history is really critical. So deciding whether a gun law, you know, passed this year, say, is constitutional requires comparing that gun law to, you know, 230 plus years of history to decide whether it's similar to previous gun laws passed by legislatures. So it's a peculiar method, and it's a deeply historical method, but there is now an originalist majority on the Supreme Court that that is a majority that thinks the Constitution should be interpreted largely as it was understood at the time it was drafted. And so that approach basically prescribes heavy reliance on history in evaluating gun laws. Now, I should say that both the majority opinion and the concurrence by Justices Kavanaugh and Roberts uh, makes clear that this opinion does not throw into doubt all gun regulations, that the Second Amendment does give government latitude to regulate guns. And I don't think this opinion throws into question, you know, the sort of the key provisions of the federal bill that is currently being debated that would address, you know, background checks and the so-called boyfriend loophole and other things. You know, I, I don't see any reason to think this decision throws that potential legislation into doubt, but there are lots of state and local gun laws that are going to get a second look after this opinion, and, and some of them uh, you know, may not survive that scrutiny. And now, Terry, even if this doesn't affect the specific legislation that's currently being debated on Capitol Hill, there are political impacts here because we are looking at November midterm elections just around the corner. So how does this factor in now to the politics? I think that's a really interesting question, Diana. I think gun ownership in our country has become a driving force in our politics. Uh, it, it's always been a cultural a division in this country. But I think now the, the ownership of weapons, especially AR-15s and the like, uh, express something in a way they didn't 20 years ago. I think they express a cultural identity, a political identity. Increasingly, you see Republican candidates brandishing AR-15s in their advertisements. And so uh, the, this puts the wind in the sails, truly, of, of those people who read the Second Amendment the way the Supreme Court does, the way they think the Constitution requires them to, uh, w which is in a really robust way, that the right to bear arms outside the home on the streets of our country uh, is presumptive, that people have a presumptive right to walk around armed in this country unless the government can show it has a very good reason and does limit that right in ways that are consistent 
with the history of gun regulation in this country. It resets the debate and empowers those on the issue of gun rights and make them feel that they are winning, not just in the battle in the courts, uh, but really the cultural battle as well, which is where the gun debate has shifted in recent years. All right, Terry Moran, Devin Dwyer, Aaron Katursky, and Kate Shaw, thank you. And I want to bring in New York Democratic Congressman Richie Torres uh, for more on this. Congressman, you know, we're going to see people reacting to this. And for some, this is cause for celebration, thinking they can now be safer. They have the freedom to protect themselves uh, should they be in danger, given the rise in gun violence. So what's your response to that? And what's the next move for New York in the wake of this ruling? Well, history tells us that more guns will lead to more gun violence. And for me, the issue is not an abstraction. I live in the Bronx, which has seen a more than 200 percent rise in the number of shooting incidents and shooting victims. And the Supreme Court striking down the proper clause requirement means that the average person will have the ability to carry a firearm in the city, in a place as densely populated as New York City. And so the public safety interest in preventing the proliferation of guns in a place as densely populated as New York has been completely ignored in favor of a general right to carry firearms in public. You know, it's one thing to possess a firearm in the privacy of your own home for your self-defense, but it's something else to bring it out into the public, which puts public safety at risk. Now, this decision includes in it this input from Justice Kavanaugh saying that licensing requirements for concealed carry permits are OK. They just can't be discretionary. So do you see changes that you could make to the law in New York that could work with that? Uh, it, it, my understanding is the decision allows for some restrictions based on particular places and particular people, those with who've committed serious crimes or those who have a history of domestic abuse. Uh, so th there can be some regulation, but for the vast majority of people, if you meet the technical requirements, if you pay the fee, pass the background check, undergo training, then you have a presumptive right to carry a firearm in public in New York City. And the ability of masses of people to carry guns in New York City is going to fundamentally change life in the city as we know it. That's something we've never had before. Crime has been on the rise in New York. How do you see this impacting that? The Supreme Court's decision is dangerous, and it's going to exacerbate the epidemic of gun violence, which has become the leading cause of death among teenagers and children. Uh, the United States has more gun violence for one simple reason. We have more guns than everyone else. We make up 4% of the world's population, or 40% of the world's guns. And not only do we have more guns, but we have less gun safety regulation. And the Supreme Court has taken that to a new extreme. Why do you think that is? The, the radicalism of the Supreme Court is not to be underestimated. Um, you know, the, the, one of the greatest challenges that we face in government is right-wing judicial activism from the Supreme Court. We've seen the Supreme Court uh, diminish the right to Miranda, uh, which dates back more than half a century. Uh, the court is on the verge of overturning Roe versus Wade, overturning more than a half, half a century of precedent. And now the Supreme Court is undermining the ability of cities like New York to keep the public safe. And there's a cruel irony here. We just passed a law in Congress that protects the safety of the Supreme Court and here you have the Supreme Court rendering a decision that puts our safety at risk. What do you, first off, why do you think New York has such a unique gun problem? And what do you say to Justice Clarence Thomas's decision here where he points out that the law in New York did not prevent the Buffalo supermarket shooting, which was one of the shootings listed in the reasons for this ruling? Well, no one claims that gun laws will prevent every single act of gun violence and mass shooting. You know, it is certainly true that New York State and New York City have the strictest gun laws in the country, but state and local laws will only take you so far because guns can freely move across state lines. So there's no substitute for federal standards of gun safety. The majority of guns recovered here in New York City are coming from the South, are flowing through the iron pipeline. If the South had stronger gun safety laws, we would have far less gun violence in New York City. All right, New York Democratic Congressman Richie Torres, we, should we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Of course. And we will be right back with more of the day's other top stories. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol is holding its fifth public hearing today. Witnesses are expected to focus on former President Trump's efforts to pressure the Justice Department to help overturn the 2020 presidential election results. It comes as the department widens its investigation, issuing new subpoenas. Let's bring in ABC's Alex Brashey in Washington and ABC News legal contributor and University of Baltimore law professor Kimberly Whaley for more on this. Thank you both for being here. Alex, the only other Republican on the committee, Representative Adam Kinzinger, will lead the questioning today. What do we expect to hear from him? Well, Diane, so we know that this committee in this particular hearing are going to drill down on about four key points. Uh, the first one is they're going to try to show how the former president uh, was trying to persuade the DOJ to publicly state that there was election fraud. Uh, another, another point that they're going to try to make is that Trump tried to pressure the Department of Justice to file lawsuits for or with the Trump campaign uh, and how the DOJ resisted uh, that, uh, that 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 claim. And then and something else uh, that we know that they're going to focus on, according to AIDS, is that Trump sought to appoint a special counsel to, persu uh, to pursue his claims. And then the last thing uh, that they're going to look to drill down on is how the former president wanted the DOJ to issue letters to states specifically concerning their elections. Now, Kimberly, three ex-Department of Justice officials are scheduled to testify. What do you think their testimonies will reveal? Well, the, the last piece of that lineup that I think that the January 6th committee is going to talk about is the pressure campaign within top DOJ officials to basically use the Department of Justice for Donald Trump's personal uh, desire to overthrow the election. So we will hear from former acting attorney general uh, Jeff Rosen and his deputy Richard Donahue that they refused to go along with that four-step plan to, you know, uh, say there was there was fraud, to use uh, the court system, to appoint a special counsel, and then lo and behold, a lower-level uh, civil person, Jeffrey Clark, was produced to replace Jeff Rosen on the theory that he would do Donald Trump's bidding. And I think what we'll hear is Jeff Rosen and others. There was a cascade of uh, potential resignations. They said, we are not, we'll, resi we'll resign in protest rather than go along with it. And then ultimately Donald Trump pulled back on that. It's sort of a redo of the famous Saturday night massacre in Watergate where we have public servants saying, no, I I'm going to do the right thing or step down and make a stink out of it publicly. Now, uh, Alex, yesterday morning, Republican Senator Rick Scott dismissed these hearings as irrelevant and said they could actually make political violence worse. What do you think he meant by that? And what's the response been from Washington? Well, Diane, he, he didn't just say that. He also called this uh, this hearing process a reality TV show. But but other folks will, will say that despite as, as partisan as this has been, it would point to the fact that it was reality and, and would point to the fact that even as early as today, we, we just got a notice about uh, in Virginia, there was an arrest, law enforcement authorities arresting a, a petty officer from the U.S. Naval Reserves for his participation in this January 6th riot. So, I mean, even as we are continuing to have these hearings we're seeing uh, the DOJ and law enforcement still round up, still prosecute people that were involved from that day. And so, yes, uh, we, we certainly have heard this this line from, from some Republicans, but the rebuttal that you hear from Democrats is, well, look, I mean, we're still seeing and still finding out the entirety of the scope uh, of, of the day and those, those, that, that, those that were actually involved. Kimberly, the committee is now delaying its final hearings for several weeks. They say to reviews, review new evidence they've received. So what do we know about that new evidence, and do you think it could impact the Justice Department investigation? So purportedly, there is a documentarian that has been subpoenaed to testify. There's a six-part documentary series supposed to come out this summer, and this person had close contact with the Trump family, uh, both in the lead-up and on the day, and uh, reportedly this is a person that the committee wants to talk to and maybe make public as part of its hearing. So we're going to continue to get more truth out of this committee, which I think is really should be called the Truth Committee, not so much the January 6th Committee. All right, Alex Perche, Kimberly Whaley, thank you both. And we will carry today's hearing live at 3 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Coming up, the dramatic rescue of an American nuclear scientist in Ukraine. Hear the details of his escape from Mariupol when we come back.
Welcome back. We're learning new details about the dramatic rescue of an American nuclear scientist in Ukraine. He had been hiding for nearly four months in the Russian-controlled city of Mariupol. And this comes as the European Union officials are meeting in Brussels today to consider Ukraine's application to join the alliance. ABC News foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge is live outside Kyiv with more on this. Tom, what do you know right now about the rescue of this American nuclear scientist and how did he get out of Mariupol? Diane, this is an incredible story. John Spohr, we understand, was living in Mariupol in southeastern Ukraine. Remember, that city was taken by the Russians right at the beginning of the war. And according to the group Operation Dynamo, an American-based group, they smuggled him out over the last few days out of Russian-controlled territory. Exactly how they did it is not clear. But it's incredible for a uh, Russian, an American citizen to evade capture in that part of the country right now, for them to be rescued and smuggled out via multiple checkpoints is unbelievable. Uh, uh, Tom, I'm looking behind you. I know you're in the bombed out cultural building there outside the Capitol. Can you tell us what happened there and how they're trying to rebuild? Yeah, this building was hit in the early stages of the war, Diane. You can see the dramatic destruction. This was a concert hall. The stage is back there. You can see how the roof has caved in. And effectively, we've been speaking to Ukrainian officials here who are now mapping, creating a 3D image, effectively, of this building. The hope is to document the destruction in terms of the war crimes investigations in this area and also use that 3D imaging to hopefully rebuild this one day. And let's talk about this EU application, because the Ukrainian deputy prime minister, she says that she's 100 percent certain that all 27 EU countries will approve to make Ukraine a candidate. What does that mean for the process? And what's the latest from the summit? This is a hugely significant moment, Diane. Look, for President Putin, it's a blow and it's a massive boost for Ukraine because the origins of the war here in Ukraine today go back to 2013, 2014, when pro-European protests kicked out a pro-Russian president from power in Ukraine. And since, there, Ukraine, since then, Ukraine has got to deal with the EU. It's been reforming the country, reforming its institutions, rooting out corruption, trying to bring its standards of governance in line with the European Union. Today, if it gets candidate status, it's a massive step forward. And really, it could take years for them to become full members, but it's a highly symbolic moment. And what's the latest on the fighting there, Tom? Well, the fighting continues in the east, in the Donbass. Uh, Russia still does not have control of a city called Severodonetsk, but it is making progress. It is taking territory, but the Ukrainians are holding them back. And breaking news within the last hour, Diane, the Ukrainian defense minister confirming that U.S.-supplied multi-launch rocket systems are now in the country. They could make a serious difference to the fight. All right, Tom Sufi Burridge in Irpin, Ukraine. Tom, thank you. And thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Mistato. Stay with us as ABC News Live continues with more news context analysis right after this. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.